students have already heard me discuss his work a little bit and we'll continue to hear about it this week. Finbar has lived for 12 years in West and Central Africa and he spent two decades covering conflicts in Congo, Chad, Sudan, Afghanistan, Libya, and Gaza. He is the 2019 Nobel Peace Prize exhibition photographer and a frequent contributor to the New York Times. His photography and multimedia work has earned numerous industry honors, including first place in the portrait category at the 2019 World Press Photo Award. He was also winner of the World Press Photo of the Year in 2006 and earned a 2020 Emmy for the PBS Frontline documentary, Ebola in Congo. He has held academic fellowships at Harvard, Yale, and Columbia University. Finbar is also a Canon ambassador. And at this point, I'm going to let him begin and I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Okay, Finbar, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Laura, and um, welcome, everybody. Okay, the screen just changed to a whole bunch of intimidating faces. So uh, I'm just going to slide that out of my line of sight. But um, thanks, thanks everybody, for joining us. Um, this is a talk that's been in the works for a while, and I'm glad we're able to, to be together today. And um, essentially, I think what I'd like to do is, is take you through uh, some of the span of my career. Um, I think the, the talk was uh, titled something to do with combat photography. So we'll talk a bit about that. Um, but more or less, I wanted to approach the theme of, of the, the program, which is about war, peace, and healing. So that's how I'll structure my talk. I'll talk about the conflict work uh, toward the beginning and then some of the other things um, as we go along. So let me just uh, share my screen with you because as I talk, my uh, plan really is to um, show pictures and uh, talk over them, so you don't have to look at me. You can um, you can just be looking at pictures as we go along. So, essentially, um, we'll start in Congo because that's. Uh, let's just see what happened there. So, um, Laura, can you just confirm that you got a picture up on your screen there? You have, okay, great. So um, I started uh, actually my career as a writer. I was a reporter and um, uh, a, a journalist reporting for the Reuters News Agency. And my first posting overseas after um, I spent a couple of years getting my career started in, in Toronto and Canada as, a, as an arts reporter actually uh, covering music and concerts, but I'd, I'd, I'd backpack through um, East and Southern Africa in, in 94, um, just as the genocide was beginning in Rwanda, I happened to be there. And then I was in South Africa as Mandela was elected. And the kind of two extremes of these experiences, the worst of what can happen um, within humanity, and then what felt like this huge wave of optimism in South Africa after years and decades of apartheid, really kind of moved me and made me want to uh, return to the continent and work in some capacity as a journalist. So my first posting was in Congo, uh, reporting uh, from there right after 9-11 uh, as it happened. Um, I took the job the week uh, of 9-11 and I was conflicted for a little bit about whether, you know, as a young journalist wanting to kind of uh, create a career and, and get something started, whether I should think about going to Afghanistan or, or somewhere in the Middle East where I knew all the focus was and attention was going to be for a while. but I stuck to my plan to go for Reuters to Congo, and I ended up spending the next couple of years covering the conflict there. And for those of you who may be familiar with it, um, you'll know that it's the deadliest conflict since the Second World War. At times, it's involved nine other countries, and um, about five million civilians have died over the last 20 years at various stages of the conflict that, that has rolled on since the Rwandan genocide in 94. And much of what I was doing was was trying to get to the parts of the world. Sorry, guys, I forgot at the beginning um, that there will be some graphic pictures in this uh, show. Um, and I will try to give you a heads up ahead of time. But because of the nature of the subject matter, um, there will be some there will be some fatalities, there will be some images of dead bodies. Um, I will try and give a heads up and I will not dwell on them too much. But I think it's part of the part of the material that we're dealing with today. 
Um, so a lot of what I was covering was this conflict and the fallout, which wasn't necessarily deaths from combat um, so much as it was um, armies taking over areas and leading to civilian deaths through lack of access to basic healthcare and uh, infrastructure that had more or less collapsed. Um, the country was very poorly developed and exploited in the extreme by the colonial power Belgium and um, left the, the, the country, which is now the second largest in Africa, um, in, a, in a state of disrepair. And, and it's been very difficult for um, people to, well, it's been poorly governed since the colonial era. And, um, and continued exploitation from outside forces has, has meant that the country has been buffeted by kind of global forces during the Cold War with competition between the US and, uh, and Russia at the time. And this has had a lasting impact on the power dynamics in the country, both local and, and regional, um, largely because the country has huge resources of gold and diamonds and timber. Um, and there's all kinds of crazy statistics like something like a quarter of all the copper used for bullet casings in World War I uh, and II came from Congo. Um, the uranium that was used in the bombs in Nagasaki and Hiroshima was mined in Congo. Pretty much the bulk of all the coltan and cassiterite that is used in our mobile phones, computers, um, and video games is, is coming from mines in Congo. So there's this vast wealth that's there that's been exploited um, for generations and generations. And recovering this conflict was, was challenging. Um, because it's hard to get to places. It's it's a huge country with very few roads, um, and it and things would happen in remote areas, and you'd hear about a battle or a massacre away in in, in the remote areas, kind of sometimes days and weeks afterwards. Um, and although I was covering a lot of these uh, deprivations and hardships, I also tried to show a more nuanced aspect of life that you see when you're living in a place like this, uh, which is that daily life goes on, people survive. Um, this is a, a very typical kind of uh, portrait of, of a money changer in, in um, Goma in Eastern Congo. And um, I'll maybe show you a bit more of, of um, this subculture called sappers, which are guys who dress up in, in fancy outfits and, and are very much at odds with many of the typical narratives that we see from, from places like Congo. Um, and I would always try and um, depict people in, in ways that was respectful and showed the strength of character that was uh, necessary to survive and thrive often in a place that was uh, so affected by conflict and strife um, as Congo is. One of the, the subjects that I did focus on at times was traditional hairstyles um, in the country. Um, you may recognize this kind of stuff from, you know, hip hop, from Coolio and, and, uh, and, and, and rappers who have adopted this, but in, in Congo where this style originated, it's a very, um, it's, it's women who would only wear this, not, not men. Um, and so over the course of, you know, the, the, the five or 10 years that I first spent in, in Western Central Africa, I was covering a lot of these kinds of stories around, around conflict. So um, uh, this is in Chad, where, again, the colonial legacy of exploitation has led to the fracturing of states, to poor central governments and rebel groups, uh, often that are divided along um, what are commonly referred to as ethnic lines or tribal lines. But these are um, lines that would have been uh, exploited again by the, by the former colonial rulers who would favor one group over another, which led to a sort of ongoing spiral of, of uh, resentment, animosity between one side and another, usually again for uh, access to natural resources, whether it's land or water or farming um, or, or valuables like uh, in Congo, whether it's gold and diamonds that you can mine just from, from you know, digging in the earth in certain areas. So this was a lot of my, my work across the continent. I covered lectures, I covered, sorry, I covered um, elections, I covered um, sporting events. As a newswire photographer, you have to do a bit of everything. But a lot of what I did was, was related to, to conflict and, and disasters, uh, whether it was famine or, or uh, 
or this kind of thing. Um, and after a while, you know, my, my bosses and uh, my editors saw that I was working in these, uh, what do we call hostile environments, environments where it's, uh, there's a fair amount of insecurity. And um, I had uh, not covered any of the conflicts in the Middle East, but um, by about 2007, 2008, I noticed that the Canadians um, were engaged in heavy combat in Afghanistan. And as a Canadian, you know, we kind of identify uh, very differently from Americans. We, we sort of look south across our border and we see Americans as, as kind of, you know, the belligerent nation that goes off and um, fights foreign wars to impose uh, it, its own idea of, of, of what democracy should be um, when there are strategic interests. Canadians, we tend to think of ourselves as peacekeepers, you know, as one of our prime ministers who who came up with the idea of UN peacekeeping and, and Canada hadn't been in any wars uh, since the Korean War. So to see Canadian forces you know, on the sharp end of fighting in Afghanistan, uh, and as a Canadian myself, I thought, well, this, this would, could be interesting for me to go and cover. I, I talked to my editors and they said, okay, great, go, go on out. And so my, my job then became, I was still based in West Africa, but I would go for you know, six weeks, two months to, to Afghanistan and I would embed with Canadian forces there and Afghan forces who were, were fighting the Taliban. And these were often, you know, almost daily firefights uh, back and forth uh, between um, the foreign forces, the, you know, the interlopers, the Canadians, the ISAF, the International Security Assistance Force, um, which was trying to, uh, in theory, uh, stabilize Afghanistan, but as we know, uh, hasn't really, never really succeeded in that, um, in that goal. Uh, and, and if we look at what's happening in Afghanistan now, we can see that the Taliban are still around, um, but uh, the American forces are leaving. So in a way, it's, it's a bit of a, um, a Vietnam situation where um, the superpowers weren't able to beat um, the insurgent forces who, who are indigenous to the region and had, had pushed out empires uh, for, for centuries. Um, including the Russians beforehand. So, you know, this took up uh, several years of my time moving back and forth between West Africa, Central Africa, and Afghanistan, uh, embedding with Canadian forces, uh, US Marines. Um, and I think over the span of three or four years, I would go back several times a year uh, to Afghanistan and, uh, and, and engage in these kind of military embeds where I had very little access to the local population, but was documenting the, the frontline fighting um, in, you know, what were essentially trenches, um, you know, mud trenches uh, in Kandahar and, and Helmand province. Um, and again, uh, a bit of a trigger warning, there, there are some bodies of Taliban coming up in the next couple of frames. Um, and uh, these were the kind of scenes that I was, that I was documenting day in and day out. Um, and as an embedded photographer, it's, it's tricky because, you know, as photographers, we're meant to be uh, impartial. But when you're spending every minute of your day on these bases with soldiers and Marines who you are reliant upon for uh, your own safety, your own survival, it is very difficult to, to kind of um, not sort of feel. And when Taliban are shooting essentially at where you are, um, it's, it's almost impossible to remain impartial. Um, so you do end up sort of sympathizing with your subjects, which, uh, you know, is, is in some ways compromising, but also, you know, I always told the, the, the military guys I was with, if you guys do something wrong or illegal or you shoot civilians, of course, I'm going to report those things. But while I was there, I spent a good amount of time with um, a, bit, uh, a squad of Marines, a squad is about 15 guys based at this outpost they called Kunjak and Thomas Brennan here, Sergeant Brennan, he was the uh, Marine uh, Sergeant in charge of these guys at this little outpost on top of a hill in a ta Taliban stronghold. And um, we got in a, a, a lot of firefights. He got injured in, a, in one of the, uh, the firefights. I think I scrolled quickly through some of the pictures there earlier of that, uh, that incident. Um, but I'll come back to him a little bit later because we, our friendship was really forged um, through, through our time there together. But as I said, I would be bouncing back and forth between Afghanistan, back to West Africa, documenting um, strife, conflict, 
And then occasionally I would have opportunities to do more socially oriented stories. So this one, you know, um, was in South Africa and it was coming up to the World Cup in 2010. And whenever you have a big global sporting event like the World Cup or the Olympics, it's an opportunity to do profiles, feature stories, we call them, of, of, uh, of the host nation. So Brazil or China, or whichever place is hosting it. And so for the World Cup in 2010, I had to think about what stories I wanted to do. And I always like to try and find stories that challenge a little bit our assumptions about a place. And so, of course, we know the history of apartheid in South Africa. We know that um, the black population there was uh, brutally oppressed for, for generations. Um, but what was little known is that since the end of apartheid and that election that I was there witnessing in 1994, there's a, there's a white demographic that um, apartheid was created to, to protect who have now found themselves on the wrong side of history. And um, these are the, the Afrikaners who um, apartheid was, was really created so that they had a social safety net, they had jobs, no matter how little education they had, but now uh, they don't have those opportunities. So an interesting dynamic has emerged where a, a lot of these folks are living in squatter camps uh, below a poverty line. Um, and this was something that I'd seen back in 94, but it was much more apparent when I was back there 16 years later in 2010. And it was an obvious thing, you know, I saw it around, but nobody really wanted to touch this story. And all the photographers who live in South Africa didn't really cover it. So when I published this story, it, it kind of um, shocked people because you don't think of white poverty in, in a place like South Africa and images like this one, which reverse completely the, the common visuals that we see from the continent of, of you know the white saviors handing out food and and things to to impoverished black africans um was turned on its head by by images like this one um and it's stories like this that i that i often tried to pursue in addition to the the more breaking news combat photography that i was doing on a lot of the the harder assignments um and these ones are tend to be more thought-provoking more um, nuanced and, and challenging. You know, have to really think about what, what's going on here in these stories to, to get a sense of a society. Um, but then I would often be returning, you know, back into, into conflict zones in places like this in Ivory Coast, uh, where there were disputed elections. Um, I'm going to skim over the next picture because it's quite graphic. Uh, so just be warned if you don't want to see it, just close your eyes. I'll tell you when we move to the next one. Um, but there were corpses on the streets. Um, and uh, from there, I was also working a lot uh, during the Arab Spring in Libya, covering uh, the conflict there. Again, uh, a lot of very heavy fighting. And um, at this point, I'd been covering conflicts fairly steadily for a number of years. And I was starting to feel the, the toll. Um, I was finding that I was getting back from assignments and I was more agitated, more um, impatient. I didn't want to go out and socialize as much and became more withdrawn um and uh in libya two good friends of mine two two of the best uh photographers of of my generation anyway um named chris hondros and tim hetherington were killed and i'd, I'd been with them um a couple of days before and sharing cars with them and i i had moved to a different location uh they they moved on down the road and uh um I think we just lost the uh, full screen there, didn't we? Um, and so uh, with their deaths, I really got shaken um, because I was also kind of reaching this point of, of exhaustion from, from the violence, from the, the continued kind of uh, sense of, of the world being this kind of bad and ugly place. Um, and I actually, after this, took a year off. I did, I did a fellowship at Harvard, um, which is a year of study on psychology, trying to understand the, the psychology behind trauma and, and what it means for me, for my colleagues who do the kind of work that I'm doing. But, but of course, more so for the, the people who were photographing, um, because as a photojournalist and journalist, you can go in and leave. But the people in, in these places are, are not so fortunate. They can't just come and go the way that we do. Um, but uh, after that year away from, from the, the front lines, I ended up being posted to Israel and ended up covering the war in Gaza in 2014. 
And uh, for all the conflicts I'd covered, this was probably some of the most, um, most difficult, partly because it came on the back of everything else I'd covered. But um, this war was one really where in, uh, in, Con in, in Gaza, it's this tiny little strip of land and Israel was responding to rocket attacks by, um, by the Palestinians. Um, but the, the use of force was far more extreme. Um, over the course of the, the war that lasted almost two months, there were about 2000 Palestinians who were killed and about 1600 of those were civilians, women, children. And so every day I was covering these uh, bombings where, and burials where it was just people being pulled from the rubble day after day, day after day. Um, and the, the whole sort of sequence of events of bombings, killings, funerals and destruction, I just couldn't get my head around it. And maybe I'll just read you a little section from my book, um, which uh, this is the book here, um, that really kind of was a turning point, uh, sort of touched on a turning point for me where I really felt like I'd, I'd had enough. Um, uh, so uh, this, is from, this is from the book, uh, the chapter called Another War. For all the conflict I've covered, I've never seen industrial killing on such a scale, nor witnessed the kind of collective glorification and documentation of death. It introduces a strange new level of torment. Every day in Gaza's morgues, I elbow my way through crowds of mourners and photographers, step through pools of blood and take pictures of mutilated bodies and piles of corpses. Anywhere else, such behavior would be absurd, unconscionable even, but here it's part of the war routine. I struggle to reconcile my own behavior with the lack of dignity accorded the dead. Then after a while, I realize it's actually a kind of ritual. It has become so much a part of what happens here that people expect it to happen and need it to happen. It's part of the mourning process. Such rituals help people cope with the immensity of the tragedy consuming them. And I wonder whether wouldn't we all evoke such rituals of our own if confronted with such grief. One afternoon on Emsida Morgue during a relative lull, there are only a few other people inside the room when a worker opens a drawer containing the bodies of three children. Their bright clothes are covered in that gray dust, their hair tussled and their limbs intertwined as if they passed out together on a sleepover. It's nothing I haven't seen and photographed a dozen times already, but for some reason, perhaps the relative quiet of that moment, the scene freezes me. I can't photograph. I'm overcome by a physical wave of sadness. I can hardly breathe. There's a weight on my chest and I feel the prickle of hot tears. I leave the gloom of the morgue and step out into the bright afternoon sun. I no longer want any part of this ritual. The media is one of the most powerful weapons in the war where Palestinians are outgunned on the battlefield. The staggering number of civilian deaths, especially of women and children, is used by the Palestinians to convey the message that Israel is slaughtering innocents on a massive scale. That much is true, but the propaganda machines and lobby groups on both sides of the conflict are working around the clock to get their version of the story heard. It's a cynical game with civilians trapped in the middle. Photography for me has always been about illustrating the common threads connecting disparate lives with a view to building empathy and understanding. But the only common thread here seems to be a mutual hatred and the lust for the destruction of the other. By contributing to the steady flow of images from the war, I feel somehow complicit in perpetuating the endless spectacle of violence with mass media amplifying and even romanticizing the very thing we seek to condemn. It was as if I wasn't there to capture an image, but to maintain one. So at this point, I really thought I had enough. I didn't want to do this kind of work anymore. Um, and it was at, at that time as well, where I'd been in contact with Sergeant Thomas Brennan, the US Marine Sergeant in that earlier photograph that I showed you. And um, Throughout our, our time after being together in Afghanistan, um, he'd been telling me about the troubles, the, the struggles he was having with psychologically and with the brain injury he, he'd suffered from um, uh, the, the RPG explosion that, that he'd been hit in, one of the uh, ambushes that we were involved with. And uh, together we started talking about our relative experiences of war, him as a participant and somebody who had killed in combat and accidentally killed children in Iraq um, and the guilt that that meant for him uh, and the difficulty he had reconnecting with his wife 
and his daughter back home. And the own guilt that I had of photographing people at their most vulnerable and um, not being able to do much about it, really. You know, my photographs I didn't feel were making much of a difference. And so over the span of two years, we worked on and, and wrote this book. Um, I won't go too much into it now, but it really was this, the story of, of how our friendship helped us kind of address the, the psychological trauma and the emotional fallout from the conflicts that we were both involved in. And, um, you know, the book is kind of three parts, what we experienced at war, the struggles that we had afterwards. For him, it was um, post-traumatic stress disorder and a suicide attempt. Uh, for me, it was the sense of kind of meaninglessness, purposeness, and, and depression. And, um, and so then the question was, how do we try and go about finding a meaningful existence after, after conflict? And for me, this meant slowly trying to get back into photography after you know, these two years away writing a book. And so I returned to Senegal and I started photographing, you know, well, I continued photographing fashion shows and, um, and the kind of things that I was um, sometimes doing when I was covering conflict, but I, I did it in a more concentrated way. And, and this really was a shift from photographing death and destruction and brutality and ugliness to, to photographing um, creativity and uh, beauty and something that brought some, you know, something back to me that felt like um, it was joyful and hopeful and more representative really of, of life in the parts of the world where I was spending time, but that we often don't see. So just like photographing white poverty in South Africa, sending out pictures of glamorous, Sorry, I think my, my connection is a little bit unstable, so I might be bouncing off here occasionally. So I'll just go back and pick up uh, wherever I can. Um, and I would, I would try and bring to, you know, the, I guess what we call mainstream Western media, uh, the kinds of images that we don't often see from, from this part of the world. And again, it, you know, these images get widely published because uh, as consumers of news, we don't tend to see these kinds of pictures so often. Uh, and this, this was restorative for me, as was writing the book. It was a kind of cathartic experience. I felt like I could, um, I, you know, we talked about the theme of the program about war, peace, and healing. And, and for me, the healing was, was the writing of the book and the return to photography through, um, through documenting these kinds of, of scenes, um, which allowed me then to gradually move back to, to covering some of the more difficult, not quite frontline stuff, but um, the work that I started doing for the New York Times was uh, back in Congo, uh, the Ebola outbreak that has, um, well, it's, it was 2019 that, that, it, that it happened. It was the second biggest one after the West Africa Ebola outbreak. So um, I traveled through these areas uh, documenting the first Ebola outbreak in a conflict zone, which brought all kinds of complications, um, where the population was very suspicious about outsiders coming to uh, vaccinate or treat people. Um, they felt that uh, there was so much insecurity and conflict in this region, they didn't understand why um, all these aid agencies and NGOs wanted to come and help when there was a health scare, but not when the people were being massacred. Um, so there was a real suspicion and, and hostility around uh, efforts to kind of uh, deal with this and, and health centers were attacked, Ebola uh, treatment centers were attacked and people broke out. Uh, this story ended up being the subject of the, of the documentary that I did as well. Um, that's available on YouTube. I can share that link later. It's only 20 minutes, but uh, it's an interesting insight into some of these uh, complex issues that have to be dealt with in, in places like this. But again, even though I'm doing these, these quite challenging stories, I'm, I'm looking for these softer threads within the story. And um, one example is this picture, which I quite like, because it's, you know, this is an example of the kind of picture that isn't necessarily an Ebola picture, but it's, it's a group of girls, teenage girls, who are practicing their instruments in, in this town that was the epicenter of the Ebola outbreak. 
And um, I took it feeling like it was a, a good photograph, but also thinking, well, the editors are never going to use this one because um, it doesn't really show in the way that some of the previous images does to the, uh, the epidemic. But actually, um, they did. They, they used this picture to close the, the report. And for me, that, that was quite a satisfying thing because it really shows, in a sense, the, um, the reality of life on the ground where, yes, there's this, this terrible epidemic, but also that life goes on, that, that things are, you know, as, they're grim, sure, in many ways, but not always as, as grim as they seem. Um, so I'll skim, I know we were sort of cruising along on time, but I'll, I'll bounce through some of the other stories I've done in the last year or so for the Times, which will show you a little bit how I've shifted um, from the hardcore frontline photography to, to kind of the blend between conflict and social issues. And this is a story I did on the vanilla trade in, in Madagascar. And we don't, we know, we think of vanilla as being very boring. Um, it's kind of the definition of boring. Um, but actually vanilla is on a lot of our perfumes and baked goods and, and um, all the things we like to cook, but it's grown, 80% of the world's vanilla comes from Madagascar where it's grown in these beautiful volcanic uh, lush lands. But two years ago, the price of vanilla shot up so that a kilo or about two and a half pounds of vanilla was worth more than two and a half pounds of silver. And what this meant is that farmers, people were raiding farmers' uh, crops and stealing them and, and killing the farmers. And there were whole criminal networks behind it. And it was a supply chain of the farmers selling to middlemen and middlemen to exporters. Um, so there's this whole fascinating chain that has a huge impact on uh, society there in terms of who's got money, who doesn't, and security, and all of it driven, much like the conflict in Congo, by Western um, consumer habits around uh, using vanilla. Um, so I'm really looking at, at stories that are having these kinds of impact on, on local communities, whether it's uh, gold miners in Congo or vanilla farmers in Madagascar, and how our appetites here in Europe, in North America, are driving um, a lot of these uh, situations in, in far off places that we don't often think about um, and children who are being imprisoned for stealing vanilla. These are all minors um, at a local prison who've been uh, saved. And when I say saved, uh, I mean it because when they're caught, the farmers will often uh, hack them to death um, for stealing their vanilla. So if they make it to the prison, they're lucky. Um, but it's all tied in with environmental exploitation, degradation, forestry, logging, um, and uh, and again, export of charcoal. Um, and uh, a lot of this is, is going to, to foreign markets. And um, we're seeing, as we did with the, with the pandemic, with coronavirus, a lot of these environmental issues around Forests coming down, the trade in uh, wildlife and bushmeats is the kind of thing that can lead to, uh, first of all, epidemics like we had with Ebola in Congo. HIV happened in the same way coming out of Congo, and then more recently with uh, with coronavirus. So, within all of these kind of situations, there's you know there are local stories, but they have global implications, or global markets are driving these things. Of course, when I'm also Doing these stories, I'm looking for other stories, and this is one that I found within the Vanilla Criminal Network story was one on bare knuckle boxing, which is a huge part of of uh, Malagash culture, and it was one of these amazing scenes and and stories where um, it's linked to the the vanilla trade and and the money that circulates around it, but it ends up being a sports story and um, and an amazing kind of visual uh, look at uh, at the local culture. Um, and there's a whole story I can, if you want, I can send links to these stories um, in the New York Times. And then the last story I did just before coronavirus hit was uh, was in the Sahel in, in West Africa and the French Foreign Legion's efforts to uh, fight ISIS there. And again, this is uh, a fascinating look again at, at global geopolitics, the idea that France, the former colonial power is still um, engaged very strongly um, in this part of West Africa, influencing governments, having an impact on people's lives on a daily basis. And um, you know that a lot of countries in West Africa have their currency tied to, to the Euro. It was originally tied to the French franc, but to the Euro. So 
these colonial legacies, and when we, we, we look at you know, the Black Lives Matter last year and all the move, movement for racial justice, all of these things are, are connected in some way to, to lasting colonial legacies on the continent. And many of the stories that I've covered are not stories about you know, local tribal disputes and massacres. Yes, those things are happening, but there's a much deeper historical reason for these kinds of conflicts happening. Um, and um, I wanted just to finish uh, before we move to the questions, if we have time, just to touch on a couple of the projects that I'm working on. You know, during the pandemic, photographers were not able to travel, but um, you might think that that would be a terrible thing for, for most people, but uh, for most photographers it was, but it ha so happened that um, I was just starting a project, another project in Congo, and I'm trying to make sure that I'm sharing the right screen here. But um, two years ago, I was commissioned by the Nobel Peace Prize to do an exhibition on that year's laureate, who was the prime minister of, um, of uh, Ethiopia. And I'm very conscious now, after having worked on the continent for so many years, that guys who come from my identity, you know, the photojournalism industry has been dominated by, by people who look like me, right? So, you know, white male photographers telling stories from from uh, from across the African continent. There's something about that 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 needs to change. Um, and so when I was given this commission, I thought, well, there's a great community of Ethiopian photographers. Um, and uh, let me see if I can collaborate with them. So I ended up doing the exhibition with um, about seven Ethiopian photographers. And this led to a shift in the way that I work. So yes, I still do assignments for the New York Times, but much of my work now is looking at ways to collaborate with, uh, with photographers in the countries um, where I'm working. And I, uh, Laura, can you tell me what you're seeing on your screen there? Is it the Nobel uh, page or is it something different? So we're still seeing, I'm seeing like thumbnails. Now okay, I'm so let me, you're seeing me. Okay, so I'm gonna try and share the screen again. Um, I want to show you some of this work. Uh, let's see. Okay, here we are. Uh, so has this come up now? Yes, the Nobel yeah. Peace Center. Yeah. So, so this was a this is the exhibition that I did with the, with the Ethiopians, which um, which was a, a great kind of way to start into these collaborative works, and and it led to me last year working on a project um, with a dozen Congolese photographers, half of them women. Um, and it was, it was a revisiting of, of um, how we look at Congo. So this was stories from Congo told by Congolese journalists themselves. So I curated, I assigned, I, I helped the photographers to solidify the ideas around the stories, but this is all their photography. And again, I can share this link. Um, and so all, and we did an exhibition, we did a book, and my, my role is really in recruiting, assigning, and, and curating this, this amazing work um, that's been done entirely by Congolese photographers. And, and so I'm now, based on, on this work, which is a website, book, and exhibition, as I mentioned, um, uh, I'm now in discussions with the International Criminal Court to do a similar type of project with local photographers in six countries over the next two years, um, looking at uh, the countries where the criminal court has uh, investigations and cases related to genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity. And um, this is really, you know, my, my focus the last couple of years has been leading these collaborative multi-platform projects that develop and promote a much more representative range of voices and perspectives within the photojournalism industry because the evolution of our industry really requires local photographers to assume a central storytelling role from their own countries rather than always having people who look like me and have my you know privileges and advantages um, having access to these kinds of stories so a lot of what i'm doing now is is talking with the the humanitarian agencies like doctors without borders and all of the aid agencies that often would fly in a photographer like me to go and document their projects 
I'm encouraging them to work with a lot of the Congolese photographers um, uh, that I've been collaborating with over the, the last year on this project. And they're getting commissions, they're getting uh, assignments, and this project that I'm that I'm in the in the process of of working out with the International Criminal Court will also be engaged um, in that same way with with bringing forward local photographers, which which is is something I'm I'm, I'm really passionate about. Um, you know, leveling this this playing field in a way where it, it's not people from my identity group that are dominating the 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 media around these kinds of stories, because there's so much more that um, can be told and shown from journalists who live uh, in these communities. So I think um, that's most of what I wanted to talk about in terms of you know the overarching idea of you know my experience with war, my transition through trying to kind of move away from it, still being linked to it in some ways, but in a different way. And how, as my career progresses, I'm, I, I, there's the healing part, but the healing part is now handing over the torch to the next generation of storytellers who will be um, really shaping the narratives around their own countries. So with that, I'm happy to take the focus off me and, and turn it over to you, Laura, and any of the questions that people may have. And um, I know I went over by 10 or 15 minutes, so I apologize for that. And we can, we can make up for it in the, uh, in the question period. No, no apologies. Thank you very much. Um, so we've had, uh, Silvano, do you want to ask your questions or would you prefer that I read some of them? Let's see. Um, I'll go ahead and, and maybe consolidate a few of them. I'll focus first on uh, Silvana's question of how do you cope with the things and the lives that you photograph? So you discuss this quite a bit um, in terms of specific times, but maybe we could frame it in how do you, how do you cope currently? How do you, what are some ongoing ways that you use to um, both process and cope with what it is you experience when you're traveling? Yeah, so I think, you know, when I started out, I was, I was the young guy, I wanted to be tough and cool and do all those things that young dudes want to do. Um, and like, yeah, this doesn't affect me. It doesn't, you know, I can do whatever. Well, anybody who says that, you know, if you care about what you're doing, if you care about the people who you're um, photographing and telling stories about, that's just not true. And, and yes, uh, I can come and go, but it does have a, an emotional fallout, it does have an emotional impact. So the thing that I found, the way that I kind of uh, healed, if you want to call it that, and manage these, these kind of, the, if we want to call it trauma, um, in a sense, because that's one version of what it is, uh, it was uh, through, um, you know, finding a new, because uh, for the longest time, my sense of purpose and meaning came from covering conflict. That was the exciting thing. That was the thing that felt important. And then when I became disillusioned with that, as I read from the book, um, I had to reevaluate what was important. And I realized that in order to feel that sense of sense of purpose and meaning again, it's really a social setting. The support is your friends, your family, the people you care about, being around them exercise and then it took time but finding that sense of purpose initially it was with the book and now it's with the kind of work that I've described to you that I'm doing um, with sharing the experience and knowledge that I've gained over time and um, and being involved with the, a younger generation of creative people and I I tap into their energy and their creative spirit to kind of fuel my own um, so I, I don't know if that answers your question but you know, from the, the more traumatized part, it was really exercise and, and uh, therapy, of course, and sometimes medication. Um, and I don't mean alcohol, I mean like actual antidepressants and so on, um, which I talk about at length in the, not at length, but you know, I, I, I touch on in the book about how, how to manage trauma, how people can manage it and how trauma is different for everybody. We, two people can experience exactly the same thing and have very different reactions. Um, and you know we can compare traumas often like the thing for journalists is we often feel like we don't have a right to feel traumatized because what we're experiencing isn't nearly as bad as what we're witnessing uh, for other people and we say that we shouldn't feel traumatized because it's nothing by comparison but 
that's not particularly helpful because there is there is an effect that it has on all of us in some way. So so those are the some of some of the ways that I cope and and really it's the human interactions that you have with people. I I'm more realistic now knowing that any picture I take isn't likely to change the course of a conflict or improve anybody's situation. But that human interaction that I have with them lingers for me, lingers for them, and it has some sense of meaning and purpose in that moment. Um, I One part of your uh, description of how you coped with and learned how to heal after, you know, some of them were more traumatic experiences was the uh, mindfulness exercises you had to go through with the raisin. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. It was a very tiny part, but it was, uh, it really put into focus the type of work that is seemingly um, minor that actually then results in some important progress, uh, just as one tiny yeah. part. Yeah, and this is an important thing, you know, so people who are traumatized or, um, yes, yeah, traumatized people tend to um, dwell a lot on the past on what has happened or become very anxious about the future um, or both. So you're living in the past, you're living in the future, but you don't tend to be present in the moment. Um, so you miss out on everything that's going on right now. And we actually only live in the moment. We don't live in the future or in the past, um, even though these things do shape how we think about things. But certainly the, the concept of mindfulness is something that I studied, that I explored, and that I, I don't actively engage in mindful meditation or anything like that now, but I do think that the exercise that I do, I cycle a lot, I have a rowing machine, and I think that sense of, of being present in your body in the moment or any of the kind of martial arts exercises that I've, or things that I've studied over time, you're very much in your body in the moment. And when you're there, you don't have time to dwell on the past. You don't have time to be anxious about the future. So yeah, that's very much, I would say, part of it, this, this idea of, of mind, mindfulness um, in that sense. So yeah. Uh, we have a question from Robbie, which I think is another excellent question. Uh, he says, how do you know the people around you would be comfortable being photographed? So I'm a six foot two white guy with a camera um, and I'm pretty good at reading body language. Um, so if I'm in an environment uh, and I have my camera, it's clearly pretty clear what I'm there to do. And so there are a lot of circumstances that I find myself in where people are not comfortable being photographed. And depending on what the situation is, I will or will not take that photograph. If those people are vulnerable and don't want to be photographed, I need to respect that. Um, if those people are uh, in positions of power, if those are police who are beating somebody and don't want me to photograph them, or if like recently I was covering uh, protests and riots in Barcelona um, and there were uh, some anarchists who were in the protests were like smashing up, uh, taking hammers and smashing storefronts and, and banks and, and burning all kinds of stuff. And they, they were kind of fringed to the actual thrust of the, of the protest. Um, I photographed them damaging property uh, and they didn't want to be photographed. So they would come at you with the hammers and stuff. And I, I would have to fight back. I had to um, resist that they don't want, you know, the fact that they don't want me to photograph them. And this is different from protesters who are genuinely part of the protest. This is something quite different. Um, uh, so, you know, you have to just read the situation. Um, I'm not going to exploit people who are in a vulnerable situation who don't want to be photographed. When I'm photographing people in, um, in uh, say, a, a refugee camp or, or somewhere um, where, where it may be a risk to their security or to their, or, or just something that they don't, they don't want to be photographed in that way, I need to respect that, and, uh, and I do. Uh, so there's loads of photographs that I would have liked to have taken that I haven't taken just because you need to you need to be a lot of photography is collaborative between you and your subject and sometimes it's just a gesture just like holding the camera and like raising it and seeing how people respond and if they turn away or if they're like no 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 um you say okay no problem uh, that's fine but if if there's a an encouraging response or they don't they don't respond then i will just continue so it's really in that sense of, of reading body language and and reading the room even if it's not a room but yeah <laughs> 
Um, so we have another question, and I think this is about the metaphoric lens. So as Westerners, how do we widen our own lens, um, even if we're not taking a photograph necessarily? How do we open ourselves up to local stories and then the global implications, the global roots of those stories, um, so that we're not maybe manipulated by well-meaning but limited media sources? That's a really good question. And I think the answer is to do your research. And I don't mean just online research. You need to talk to people, uh, to local journalists. A lot of times you'll see, you know, uh, a European or American photographer go to a place like Afghanistan or go to Congo or Ethiopia or anywhere, and they won't engage with the local journalists and, and won't spend time with them. And they are a really valuable resource and you need to understand how they see things and understand that when we go into these places we bring all our cultural baggage with us and our that baggage is going to shape how we see the world and how we portray um the world and it's only a sliver of of reality and that's why i'm i'm so engaged now with 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 widening these perspectives um because by working with congolese photographers when I go back to Congo, I'm going to look at things differently than, than I may have done 10 years ago. Um, we need to uh, read books uh, that help us to understand these colonial legacies, these racial imbalances, all of these kind of historical uh, structural um, impediments to uh, access to the media for, for journalists from these communities, but also you know, that's why when I'm framing the stories that I'm talking to you about, I'm not trying to frame them strictly in the sense that, you know, uh, the things that are the brutal things that are happening in Congo are not because Congolese are barbaric. It's because the system of oppression and exploitation brought from the outside is barbaric. Um, and we need to recognize that we need to understand that. Um, you know, I sometimes hear photographers say covering the war in Bosnia was so shocking because we couldn't believe something like that genocide could happen in Europe after World War II. Like what? So the only, these things can only happen in Africa or these kinds of massacres can only happen in Cambodia or in Latin America. And that, that I, I can't believe that people will have that that frame of thinking in this day and age. We need to really advance the way that we look at the world and interrogate ourselves and our own perspectives in a way that really questions um, why things are the way that they are and what role our outside um, societies and the power dynamics have been at play globally for, for generations. Um, we have a question from Diana. She wants to know, have you remained connected to any of the people other than Americans and Canadians that you've photographed? So I guess you're yes, yes. subjects as opposed to other photographers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, for example, uh, at the end of last year, uh, I was in the Canary Islands, which are Spanish islands off the coast of West Africa. And with a lot of the migration routes uh, through the Mediterranean being closed off um, for people who were trying to flee across the Mediterranean, like they were in 2015 and 2016, there's now a migration route that goes a, a much more dangerous one that goes through the islands in West Africa. So. I met a load of Senegalese guys who'd made the journey across on a boat that was very dangerous. And um, they've been working their way through the system, uh, the immigration system, the Spanish immigration system there. So I'm in touch with them on WhatsApp all the time. In Congo, I do go back and I, I see um, people who I've reported on in the past. Uh, there's an old tailor, there's a guy I met at a refugee camp, there's a tailor there. Um, and so, yeah, uh, of course, TJ, the guy who I wrote the book with, but he, he's American. Um, and uh, yeah, I have returned years later sometimes to, to places where I, where I reported. And uh, I, I don't necessarily know that I remain friends uh, or in touch with them on a regular basis, but I do return uh, when I can um, to places I've been before, because there is something really important on revisiting those, those kind of um, connections that, that you have and seeing how things progress over time or don't progress as is often the case. But Senegal is a great example. I mean, I lived there for 10 years. So I have like loads of Senegalese friends who um, all those fashion pictures are, are, you know, they started off as people who I was photographing, but then I got to know and, and um, 
who I see all over that region now because they move around uh, for their fashion shows and and uh, yeah, I mean those are some of my closest friends in the region now. Um, so we have a few, we have maybe two or three more questions, and then um, if anyone has something they would like to ask and hasn't put it into the chat yet, uh, now would be the time to do that because we'll be wrapping up in the next few minutes. Uh, while we're waiting to see if other people have questions to ask, another question that was uh, asked was, do you, do you feel like some of the people you have photographed have actually wanted to be photographed, not just um, in terms of, of feeling comfortable with it, but they actually want it as a way of communicating with the rest of the world, perhaps to ask for um, attention or help for their situation? Yeah, I certainly have had that experience. Um, and sometimes it's not just a like a photograph or a series of photographs, but it's the conversation that you have with people. So uh, this tends to be in the more remote places where uh, sometimes they, they may not have encountered a journalist before. Um, but, you, you know, for example, on the border between Sudan and, and Chad, I, one specific example was when um, I, I was doing a story on, on uh, people who had fled from Darfur and they were in Chad and uh, refugee camps. And, um, and I just spent a couple of days with, with this guy and his family and he just wanted to tell me all his story and, and what had happened and the whole sequence of events that, that had taken place. And he really wanted this story to be told. And he said, thank you for coming all this way um, to, you know, to, to, to hear and tell, tell the outside world what's going on here because people need to know. And these are the kinds of things that you do encounter over and over again. Um, so it, it's not necessarily just a picture, but sometimes, sometimes people uh, who are in these situations, al although we know that they don't often, you know, one picture or one story isn't going to change everything, but the feeling that I have is is more along the lines of the you know each story each picture is contributing to the trickle of information that can become a flow uh, that can eventually perhaps uh, influence decision makers at some level whether it's around a crisis in in eastern Congo or on the border with Darfur um, and sometimes it's forensic evidence. You know, I have friends who worked a lot in Central African Republic, and now that their work is being used at the International Criminal Court, and they're testifying there um, in court for war crimes tribunals. So yes, I have had people want to tell me their stories um, so that I can share them with, with the outside world. And I think they understand that it may not have any immediate impact on them, but they still People want to be heard. People don't want to feel like they're languishing in obscurity and hopelessness. And I think sharing, you know, we're human beings. We have um, this long tradition of storytelling. It's how we understand the world. It's how we relate to one another across, you know, across you know, centuries, millennia and, and cultures. But even within families, that's how we understand the world around ourselves is through storytelling. So I think somebody sitting down and telling their story is is really meaningful, even if it may not revert, revert to them in some tangible way, other than just sh the sharing of a story. We have we have three more questions, and then we'll be probably wrapping up. Um, I think there are three sure. excellent ones that could actually all turn into very long discussions. Uh, the first one is. Um, really about maybe your own expectations or your own ideas before you actually are on location to shoot something. Do you have thoughts that shape what you're going to focus on or how you're going to take pictures before you actually get to an assignment? Yeah, it's interesting. Sometimes you have a really specific idea of what it is you want to get, maybe because you've seen some of the imagery that's come from there before or you, you have a really strong sense of what the story could or should be. And then you can, you know, you don't, you don't want to have a confirmation bias where, where you need to go in with the wrong narrative and then try to prove it. But if you've done your research, if you've spoken to people, you should have a sense of what the story is. And then you're open to that changing at any time or it evolving or developing in some way. But yeah, I, 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 I do tend to have a sense of what I want. Like, so for the vanilla story that I did in Madagascar, I knew, I knew that I wanted a picture of a farmer 
sitting in his field at night with his either gun or machete around a campfire because that's what they do and that tells the story he's camped out in his field at night protecting it from thieves and I, was like, I got to get a picture like that and so I found a farmer who was willing to let me camp out with him and I got that picture and it ran on the front page of the New York Times with the story um, so sometimes it's like that other times you go and you don't really know what you're doing um, and that sometimes works out really well too but, but generally you have a sense of what you need to get I would say um, this, the stories where I felt have, have been most successful are, are where I, I have a sense of I know what the picture is. So Ebola, I need. I know I need to go to the epicenter, to the town where the attacks have been happening on the Ebola treatment centers, and try and spend time there, uh, and try and meet the guys who've been attacking the centers if I can, if it's safe. How do I orchestrate that? So, so yeah, you 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 do have to have a sense of the story and what you're trying to accomplish, but you do need to be open to to that changing um, and to being wrong and and revisiting, you know, how it's going to be. I like the uh, the Abercrombie and Fitch shirt in the in with the vanilla farmers. Mm. It's this. I can't really, even remember. Oh, the really the yellow odd one, juxtaposition yeah. of. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you get people. crazy stuff like that sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. have you ever doubted yourself as a photographer? And if so, what helped every, you? Every single that time doubt? I step out with the camera. Every single time. Um, every time I go in a story, I worry I'm not going to get the pictures. I think the anxiety. You know, you, you learn, I've learned now to accept that that's part of any assignment. And that's what motivates you to get up at five in the morning to get to the place where the light will be good, to push that little bit, make that extra effort when it feels like maybe there's no point in driving that extra 45 minutes to maybe meet that person who might be there or might not be there. Well, if I don't go, I'm definitely not going to get the picture. So let me just go. And if it's a waste of time, it's a waste of time. But yeah, constantly, especially when you're on assignments, New York Times, the editors are expecting you to deliver. Um, all of these pressures certainly uh, exist uh, for the Nobel, you know, um, exhibition as well. You know, I had I had a couple of weeks in Ethiopia to try and do an exhibition on a country that is uh, hugely strategically important and regionally important and incredibly complex. How do you get all of that nuance in a couple of weeks? Well, you can't. That's why I, I tapped into the. Um, the resources of the Ethiopian photographers who'd been documenting it already, but but certainly, yeah, you're you're constantly doubting yourself, but also confident that if you do things properly uh, and 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 put in the work, um, ho hopefully, hopefully, it'll all work out. And yeah, sometimes it doesn't, but sometimes the uh, the journalism gods uh, are in your favor, and that's what you always hope for. And as a somewhat connected question, um, after all that you have experienced and been through and witnessed, would you still choose the same career path? Yeah, I think I would, to be honest. I mean, it's a difficult one for people who are looking to get into it. Uh, photojournalism is, is, is a, an, a, an industry constantly in flux. The, you know the financial side of it for people getting into it it's really difficult you know editorial budgets have, have diminished um and i'm working mostly from grants and from the kinds of collaborations that i talked about rather than from assignments so having to adapt and shift and 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 move uh to constantly moving target we have to evolve uh, as photographers and you know i do some film stuff now as well so uh yeah i think you know in terms of the, the thing that I, you know, if we go back to what, what I started with, which was backpacking after college through through parts of East and Southern Africa in 1994 and experiencing the start of the Rwandan genocide and then Mandela being elected, it was then that I thought that I really wanted to be around these historic events unfolding and being, you know, on the sidelines of history, as, as is often said for journalists and and, and really it's a privilege and an honor and a big responsibility to be there documenting these things. Um, and I think, yeah, it's challenging at times. It's lonely at times. It's dispiriting and depressing at times. But looking back, would I change it? I don't think so. I might change certain things, how, how I do certain things or when I do certain things. Um, 
but certainly I don't I don't have regrets and I feel you know um, there have been times where I thought you know this is not what I want to do anymore but but at the moment um, the work I'm doing doing is is very satisfying very rewarding and um, and uh, I'm really enjoying it and you know talking on in sessions like this is is all part of that you know I get a real kick out of sharing these things and, and hoping that people can take something from it as well. And then uh, for our final question, how did you go about the process or what would you say was your process of translating your thoughts and your experiences into words for your book? <laughs> for shooting ghosts specifically. Yeah, very slowly. Um, uh, it was a long process, I would say, you know, <coughs> excuse me. So it took me time, you know, that, that fellowship that I did uh, for that year, um, Harvard was spent studying and processing a lot of my experiences, talking it over uh, therapy, um, speaking with psychologists and doing a lot of reading actually to try and understand um, what, I, what I had experienced. And then, you know, as I said at the beginning also, I, I started as a writer before I became a photographer. Um, I was a reporter who moved into photography because my stories felt like they weren't getting the attention um, that I felt they deserved. Uh, but suddenly when I started taking pictures, they were widely published on front pages and in magazines and stuff. So I reverted really to, to, uh, to, to the old form of communication and telling stories, which is the, the written word. And um, it takes time. Writing is a, a labor, uh, not always of love, but it's, uh, it's, it's hard work. And, and it does take time. You rewrite and you rewrite and you edit. And uh, I would say from beginning to end, the book took about four years um, because I was working during a lot of that as well. But, um, but it, was, it was cathartic. And um, I spent a lot of time on the bicycle, you know, thinking about how do I want that sentence to be? Where does that word go? What's that thought? And, you know, re listening to audio books as part of my research and, uh, and just trying to absorb and, and put everything through the brain filter in some way where it could come out the other side as a story that made sense and hopefully would ring true and feel authentic to people in a way that they could relate to uh, me as the journalist or to TJ who co-wrote the book with me as a Marine and the military experience in, as a, for Americans. So really it was, it was about um, just trying to make sense of, of things for ourselves. That was for me personally reading the book, that was one of the, um, the points of your expertise that I thought was, was so consummate is that you were able to make experiences that the majority of us will never get to witness or be involved with directly relatable and it was very it was a very relatable narrative and i was shocked by that because of how unusual your experiences are so for those of you who haven't read it i would really encourage you to because it was phenomenal so thank you very much for being with us today thank you so much for your time and i'm glad we finally got to sit down and do this um uh laura maybe if there's any of the kind of stories or issues that we talked about um you could share links with people uh whether it's the madagascar vanilla or the ebola documentary if people are interested in those stories um maybe you could send out a send out an email to, to folks who want to follow up with that stuff yeah i think that would be wonderful so what i'm going to do right or now is just the, show everyone or especially the congo the congolese photographers especially Right. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen briefly so that everyone has the, uh, let's see. Uh, I think I am, it's not large enough. Anyway, I'm going to, just going to briefly uh, talk about the upcoming events. But uh, for those of you who would like uh, links to the projects and the articles that Finbar has talked about today. Um, you can send an email to legacy at ccm.edu and we will follow up with you to give you that information. I was going to put that up on the slide, but for some reason it's not working. So thank you so much, Finbar. We really appreciate it.
It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you to everyone for uh, attending. And, and um, I, we hope you will join us for our uh, next two upcoming legacy events that you can find out about on our website. Thank you. Thank you.